So this morning we're going to chat about lateral mass fixation and laminoplasty, some operative nuances. All right, so we know that lateral mass fixation has been used for uh, a number of years and it's a workhorse for the posterior corridor. Um, <clears throat> this was a paper done um, a handful of years ago by our good buddy Jeff Coe et al. Um, and they did a retrospective review um, and they looked at 22 articles. Uh, the risk complications were low and the fusion rate was high when lateral mass screw fixation was used. Um, nerve root injury rate was uh, low at 1%, uh, and there were no cases of vertebral artery injury in this uh, set. And the screw rod pullout, screw plate breakage, screw loosening occurred in less than 1% of those screws inserted. Um, so we all use this technique, and it, we can have fantastic results for, you know, all sorts of pathologies with this. Um, but I think sometimes it's um, not taught in a lot of training institutions, especially for residents, maybe coming from orthopedic settings, they're not getting um, enough exposure to posterior fixation and it's a whole new world. So I thought I'd go over some of the nuances. Um, <clears throat> first and foremost, when I look at these cases, I think about incision planning. Um, if we all put our hands on the back of our neck and upper thoracic spine, we're going to feel a bony prominence of a, a of a SP. Um, and what I've tended to do lately is I use a lazy, lazy S incision around this to avoid uh, putting the incision over this um, so it makes for a better wound closure. <clears throat> Here's a post-op patient 12 weeks out with a lazy S. Um, and we can see what happens is if we do put our incision uh, directly over the bony prominence as we start to have muscle retraction and so forth, you can end up with this um, uh, spinous process eroding through the skin and um, having you know, a big mess for uh, the patient with deep infection and potentially having to have hardware removal. So using this technique, um, now for a number of years, I haven't had any of these um, horrific um, returns to the office. <laughs> um, the next thing I do is once I do the lazy ass skin incision, incision, I'll mobilize the muscle planes and serial layers. I'll make sure that I stay in the midline. Um, if the trapezius is uh, a bit on the scant side, I'll actually tag it with silk suture. So at the time of closure, I can um, bring that together in its own separate plane. Um, then I'll start to take off all the various layers of muscle, resecting the splenius and so forth, um, being very mindful of hemostasis as I go um, and sparing as much tissue as I can, particularly at C2 if I'm not including that in the construct. <clears throat> Once I have everything um, cleaned up and, and laid out, um, there are some other considerations with this. Number one, which I've seen um, a lot of times in the training setting is that, you know, as you're starting to run your bovi, it gets over the lateral edge of the lateral mass um, and there's a lot of venous bleeding. And the instinctive thing to do is you put more heat on it with the bovi or bipolar and it doesn't stop it. Uh, that's because there's these rich uh, veins and plexes that live over the side of the lateral mass. The best thing to do in that case is just to pack it off with some uh, surge of flow, uh, cottonoid and come back to it later. And it usually stops on its own. The other thing that one needs to be really respectful of at the time of exposure is staying out of the inner laminar space with instruments and bovies. Uh, moving on here, just a brief view, overview of some of the anatomy we're looking at. Um, you know, understanding the relationship of the lateral mass to the transverse foramen. Um, you know, the anterior and posterior tubercle lying before this, the cervical pedicle, the lamina, spinous process, articular processes, and um, the vertebral body itself. Um, and we think about 
you know, the lateral mass in terms of quadrants delineated medially by the laminar lateral mass junction, and then dividing the lateral mass into quadrants. Um, and lying deep beneath this, we have the exiting nerve root coming off the canal, and we have the vertebral artery. So uh, making this um, quadrant visually and physically helps us to avoid injury to these vital structures. Um, also having an understanding sort of of the plane and trajectory of the facet um, is also useful in placing our instrumentation. Um, there's been numerous um, uh, descriptions of placing lateral mass fixation over the years um, from Roy Kamib to Matt Magrill, Anderson, and on. Um, all of these have, you know, various angles to which you should uh, turn your hand to get proper fixation and placement of the screws. Um, and as well as at what point you will enter into the lateral mass, um, looking down on this um, while in the OR. Um, however, the technique that I was taught and I've used now for a long, long time is, is you know, what Dan Rue has described and that's using an entry point one millimeter medial and one caudal to the center of the lateral mass and you aim towards the upper and outer corner of the lateral mass. So it's kind of, it's a lot easier than trying to remember angles and so forth. Um, and it really puts you into a more anatomical position um, just by shooting towards the corner of this. As we all know, when we perform posterior surgery, there's a lot of dysmorphic bone that we're looking at. And if we merely try to um, estimate off of, um, you know, medial lateral and uh, cephalad trajectories of our drilling, um, this would oftentimes lead us into uh, spaces we don't want to be. But using the root technique, um, it seems to put the screw exactly where it needs to be every time. Um, and ultimately, you know, when we also select these entry points, <clears throat> we want to be mindful of how we're going to link all this together. So sometimes you may have to cheat your entry point um, medially or laterally, provided that you have enough bone mass for fixation, just so at the end of the case, you can get everything to line up um, and to avoid sort of, uh, you know, difficult rod contouring at the end of the case when the cord's exposed. <clears throat> so once everything's laid out, the first thing I'll do is delineate the lateral mass laminar junction, and I'll generally bovie this. Um, operative markers tend to sort of um, not stick to the bone and wash away uh, very shortly thereafter. And then I'll divide the lateral masses into quadrants, and I'll generally mark this out with a bovie. <clears throat> and then if there's any irregularities in the facet, such as, you know, it's hypertrophic or overgrown, I'll gently resect it with a three millimeter matchstick, or um, I have a forward facing osteophyte biter. So I'll manicure that down just to make sure that I have a uh, full view of the lateral mass. Uh, and then the next thing I do <clears throat> is I change drill bits and I start my uh, divot with a two millimeter drill bit. And why this is important, if we were to use our matchstick, which is three millimeters, and we put it sort of on its side at an angle to make this divot, um, we might end up making a perforation into the lateral mass that is actually bigger uh, in diameter than the 3.5 millimeter screws that we typically use. <laughs> So I'll use this small two millimeter, it looks like a pineapple, uh, and I'll make the perforation with that and I'll make it, you know, just medial and just caudal to that center point of the lateral mass. <clears throat> um, and I'll also make sure that, you know, my um, entry points are lined up such that um, the whole continuum is um, confluent. <clears throat> and I'll also make my thoracic screws um, in alignment with uh, the lateral mass screws. So I don't have this, you know, major offset at the T, uh, CT junction. And then the other thing I'll do is I'll just pierce the cortex with this. I won't get into the lateral mass. I won't start to deviate because this isn't a um, backstop drill um, with, a, with a guide. So I'll just pierce the cortex. <laughs> and so with a guide, 
Um, I used the 2.4 millimeter uh, drill and the depth guide, and I'll drill again towards the upper outer corner of the lateral mass. <clears throat> and I generally start at 10 to 12 millimeters, uh, depending on sort of the size and morphology of the patient and their bone. Um, following this, I'll palpate this with a ball tip probe. Um, occasionally I'll tap beyond that. If for instance, I wanted a bicortical purchase, um, and then I will follow this with a three millimeter tap. <clears throat> I like to do sort of all of this um, sharp instrumentation passing prior to removing the lamin in these cases to avoid any inadvertent um, touching of the cord. So some troubleshooting, if the lateral mass is significantly dysmorphic, <clears throat> then it, what we can oftentimes do is to um, really delineate the angle of the facet either by, you know, taking down the capsule with the bovi and placing a pen field in it, <clears throat> or sometimes just putting the tip of the bovi in it, just so we understand the angle a little bit better. Um, occasionally we'll have these very compacted lateral masses, um, which is, you know, sort of become dysmorphic over time. And in that case, I'll skip these levels um, or, or you'll end up in this situation where the tulips from the screws are so clustered together that you're really unable to get a rod to set down in there. <laughs> the next thing I'll do if this is a case where I'm doing a decompression is I'll resect the inner spinous ligament between the uh, cranial, cranial and caudal um, segments, which is typically C23 and C7T1. <laughs> um, at that point, I'll perform dome laminotomies of C2 and T1. Um, and I will add, I do all, all this under high powered loop magnification. I think for me doing this under a microscope is kind of challenging with the angles and moving my hands about. Um, I found that loop magnification works just great. <laughs> Uh, once I've uh, expanded this interlaminar opening, I'll section the ligamentum flavum um, between these um, vertebral segments. <clears throat> At this point, I use a three millimeter matchstick to drill troughs at the lateral mass laminar junction. Um, it's important not to deviate too far into the lateral mass or you end up with a lot of bleeding. Um, and also it's important that the angle of your hand shouldn't be facing directly towards the floor, but should really be parallel to or perpendicular to the um, angle of the lamina. So this way you're making sort of this V, which is projecting towards the canal. Um, and as I make these cuts, I paint with the drill. Um, this is something that, you know, we tend to see fellows and residents do. They'll poke with the drill, but you, if you paint with it, you're able to sort of, you know, shave a line and you start to understand that the lamina is thicker superiorly and thinner caudally. So as you sort of paint through this, you're able to go through the outer cortical layer, the inner cancellous bone. <clears throat> and then um, if you have a really good control of the drill, you can actually paint through the inner cortical bone down onto the ligamentum. That's typically what I'll do. Um, and under watchful supervision, have the trainees do this as well. Um, beyond this, <clears throat> uh, what we'll do is run a, a number two or number three kerosene through the trough um, and complete the uh, resection of any remaining bone, um, whatever facet may be in the uh, trough itself and the underlying ligamentum. At this point, um, I'll gently elevate the end block laminectomy specimen away from the cord and dura. <clears throat> I'll use my other hand, uh, which is um, armed with a number one pen field or an inverted 15 blade to section away any areas of adhesion um, that might be sticking to the dura. Um, once this is done, <clears throat> um, I'll check uh, MEPs, thoroughly irrigate the wound. <clears throat> and then at this point, what I'll do is I'll decorticate the lateral mass and I'll get into the facets and decorticate them as well. Um, once you have uh, screws and rods in place, there's a lot of um, 
you know, instruments which are giving you in, inter, interference to access to these bony surfaces. Um, <clears throat> so at this point, um, again, I'll take all caution to avoid contact with the cord, um, clear, carefully place the screws, um, and it might be useful to use favored angled screws at the top and the bottom of the construct, just so you have um, additional uh, degrees of freedom um, aiming towards the, the entirety of the construct. So with the rod placement, <clears throat> I'll ensure that I have these rods contoured um, as perfectly as possible uh, so as to avoid attempting to reduce the rod into the screw head tulip. And again, avoiding contact with the cord as you're doing sort of these power moves with rod placement. Um, then I'll put the set screws in and final tighten. <clears throat> At this point, um, I'll put the bone graft in lateral to the rod. Um, I will usually use like a DBM product medially to that to create a wall to prevent any, you know, autograft uh, bone chips from falling in on upon the dura. I'll place fibrillar over the dura itself, make sure I have hemostasis. <clears throat> I'll place a 19 round Blake drain. Um, I've had a few patients over the years that had a hemovac in that still developed a hematoma. So now I use these, you know, beefy plastic strains on all of these cases. And then after removing the retractors, I uh, just double check to make sure that, you know, any bone graft didn't fall in from the, you know, outside of the rod onto the cord. <laughs> Upon closure, I'll separate out all these muscular layers and sometimes uh, depending on sort of the, the health of the muscle tissue, the bulk of the muscle tissue, I'll use um, non-resorbable sutures um, just to loosely pull these bands together in the midline and then I'll close each subsequent layer of uh, fascia and muscle over it. Uh, and especially with the trapezius layer, um, I'll make sure that I have really uh, solid bites in this and I'll pull it together. <clears throat> and then for the skin, I'll use um, horizontal mattress sutures to detension the wound edges. Um, I have a whole dressing protocol that I use to ensure um, keeping the wound as sterile as possible and for as long as possible. <clears throat> Switching gears to laminoplasty, um, you know, this was originally described as a non-fusion <clears throat> alternative um, to decompress the cord over multiple levels while avoiding post-laminectomy kyphosis. Um, you know, the first laminoplasty technique was the modification of Carita's technique for laminectomy in which the lamina were thinned and then partially removed. Oyama developed a Z-plasty uh, method for laminoplasty. After thinning the lamina, uh, Z cuts were made at each lamina and they were lifted and fixed with sutures to reconstruct and expand the canal. <laughs> Quite complex. Um, Kurokawa did an open door, uh, French door technique <clears throat> where um, green stick cuts were made at the lateral mass laminar junction. And then the spinous process was opened in the middle, um, and this was uh, pulled open, and one could place a bone graft in between to keep these separated. <clears throat> also a very uh, technically challenging surgery. Um, <clears throat> I'll add one more thing to this. There have been iterations of muscle sparing um, you know, advances to this technique. Um, I've personally never done one. I've looked at them and read about them and they appear very, very technically challenging. <clears throat> um, so I haven't really uh, jumped on board with that yet. Um, Hirabayashi uh, described the open door laminoplasty. <clears throat> and I think that's the one most commonly used by uh, myself and most colleagues that I know. In this procedure, the bony gutter, gutters are drilled at the border of the lateral mass and lamina. Um, on one side, the uh, trough is drilled down just to the inner cortex, and on the other side, a complete cut is made. Um, the <clears throat> ligaments and so forth around these 
um, can be uh, sutured so this stays open, or nowadays uh, we all have some version of plate or plate and or bone plug, <clears throat> which are fixed onto the uh, lateral mass and lamina to hold it open. Uh, some of the nuances that I would add for the trainees <clears throat> is, you know, there needs to be extreme caution uh, to avoid uh, putting the cautery into the facet capsule and that this is a non-fusion procedure. Um, and so while we're doing the exposure, um, you may have to do some blunt dissection uh, over the, the lateral mass. Um, just be very cautious of the facet. <clears throat> Um, once again, we'll delineate the lateral mass laminar junction. Um, at this point, what I'll do is use um, the guide to mark out where I'll put the laminar screw in. And then there's these very small 1.5 millimeter drills, which will perforate only to a depth of, you know, four millimeters. And I'll use those to create... Um, the um, perforation and the cortex of the lamina. Um, and then I'll place the laminar screw. On um, the hinge side, I'll drill a partial thickness uh, trough. Um, and you also have to make sure this has a sufficient enough sort of V opening, meaning it's, it's deeper at the superficial surface rather than the deep surface, such that when you open this up, you don't have um, a door stop blocking you from getting a, a full swing of the, the lamina. Um, on the opposite side, you'll do a full thickness trough, again, being mindful of avoiding violating the facet. Um, and I'll use a kerosene to complete the opening. So one thing that I'll generally do is attempt to leave the tension band in place, you know, the epispinous and interspinous ligament. Um, and as I start to mobilize with gentle, gentle finger traction and use of an upgoing curette, to hinge the lamina open, I'll assess to see if I need to section any of this. Oftentimes I'll need to section at least half of the ligamentum um, on the open side of this, um, but it really depends on a patient by patient setting. Uh, and so once this is opened and freed, um, I'll check motors to make sure everything is intact. And then I'll proceed with placing um, the plates. So the plate system that I use is Nuvasive featured here, and I have no financial reward from this. Um, I'll take the plate and I'll use that sort of fork end of it and place it under the um, laminar screw, which has a little flange in it. And then it also has a little buttress to help hold the lamina from uh, settling back into the canal. And then on the opposite side, it has a little ridge. So it'll hook onto the lateral mass edge of this. Once I have this in place, I'll hold it securely. And then I'll make, you know, the perforations into the lateral mass and then insert screws into it. Um, and these are usually five millimeter screws in depth. Um, there, I believe there's also four and six available. <clears throat> and I'll make sure this is uh, securely fashioned at all the levels. Um, and so just to sort of underscore this technique again, if we look here at picture A, we want to make sure that we're uh, perpendicular to the lamina as we make this opening. <clears throat> we drill directly towards the canal. Um, on one side, we do a complete opening, and on the other side, we do uh, a partial opening. And as I'm drilling each of these, I'll take my thumb and put it on the spinous process and kind of pull it to the um, hinge side to make sure that it's free. <clears throat> Oftentimes, you're, you know, the, the segment becomes plastic in a sense because you've thinned out the hinge side sufficiently. And then once I have, then I move on to the next level. Um, there are some plate systems that do have uh, these sort of um, pieces of uh, allograft bone that are cut uh, to certain uh, millimeter dimensions. So if you wanted a five millimeter opening, they'd have those available. 
<clears throat> um, and here's some pictures of what this looks like afterwards. So um, again, this is sort of a, a great technique, but there's a lot of nuances to this. Um, in fact, I think doing uh, lateral mass screws and par screws and so forth is a lot less technically challenging compared to uh, doing a laminoplasty, which has and requires a lot of very fine movements and placement of, you know, very delicate pieces of instrumentation. Um, but uh, patients are generally pretty satisfied with this, uh, you know, post-operatively, um, these patients um, do well, you open up the canal, um, you know, the literature shows that these folks have, um, you know, better range of motion than an effusion patient. Um, and there's a whole data set that can go into that. And that's sort of a talk in and of itself, looking at sort of, you know, what, what happens with laminoplasties afterwards. Um, <clears throat> I know we're sort of at the mark of the half hour. Um, I just wanted to share with everybody um, this past weekend, um, the U.S. Uh, open Pro Adaptive Surf Competition was held here in Oceanside. And I spent Spent three days volunteering. Um, down in the bottom corner here, this is Roy Tuscany, a dear friend and founder of the High Fives uh, Foundation. And it was just a fantastic weekend. We had athletes with, you know, all sorts of disabilities ranging from, you know, uh, lost limbs to being, you know, complete spinal cord injury folks on, um, you know, wave skis, belly boards, um, all sorts of adaptive equipment at play here. It was an absolutely tremendous event and great to get out there and help the athletes. Um, and I got want to give one little shout is that, um, in a couple months, we're going to go to the BSR wave tank in, uh, Texas. Um, and if anybody wants to help, uh, donate, um, a little something for the athletes, um, it'd be greatly appreciated. Um, it's, you know, we on, on the front end deal with, you know, people on a weekly basis with spinal cord injury. Um, but on the back end, um, what is completely awesome is to put a big smile on their face by doing these activities that they desperately need and enjoy. Um, and so we're at the hour and I thank you all for paying attention. Any questions? <laughs> Hey, Don, it's Hanny. That was uh, an awesome talk. And I think the um, audio visual that you had was really good as well for the fellows. A lot of our talks don't have that sort of um, intricate detail. One thing that I just wanted to reiterate is how important it is, Cody and, and Micah, to pay attention to the soft tissues the way that Dr. Glasswitz does. Those incisions, if you, know, if you don't take sort of special care to stay in the midline, stay out of the vascular planes and, and try to really reapproximate the muscles, I think they can just have tremendous neck pain. And if you do it well, or you take care and kind of do it the way that Don um, described, and I think that neck pain and the spasm can go away after a couple of weeks. But if you just kind of slash and burn and you're, you know, not in midline, you're getting into the muscle, I mean, they can have basically chronic neck pain. So I think that's critical. Um, but Don, my two questions were, um, one, can you uh, describe just your sort of indications for laminoplasty versus lamin fusion? And then maybe briefly just touch on how you think about the th cervical thoracic junction. Like, do you put in C7 screws if you're going to T2? Do you leave them out? Um, how do you feel about stopping at C7, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so with the first question, laminoplasty patients, um, I'll kind of use the general rule of thumb. They don't have axial neck pain. Um, they have multiple levels of compression. I wouldn't do laminoplasty just at one or two levels. It would really be sort of the, the run of the subaxial spine. <clears throat> and then three, I'm sort of mindful of what their T1 slope is. It's interesting if you look at the literature, um, you know, one of the, um, well, also loss of lordosis. One, 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 one mindset is that if there's a high T1 slope um, greater than 32, that patients sort of have um, an increased um, risk of postoperative kyphosis, but there's a, another sort of arm of literature. And it says that if patients have a high T1 slope and a matching amount of cervical lordosis, 
they're less likely to fall into kyphosis. So I think you need to look at each and every one of those cases to make sure, um, you know, they don't have an excessively high T1 slope, and especially one of these high T1 slopes where their cervical spine projects forward and they have a high uh, CSVA. So that, that's sort of like the basic algorithm I'll use when thinking about laminoplasty or, or those, those elements. And then in terms of crossing the junction, I don't cross the junction in all cases. Um, if I do, I will oftentimes leave out the C7 screw, or if I feel like I really need it, I'll put in a C7 pedicle screw, um, and then I'll link up to T1 or T2, and it really depends on sort of um, the case, the length of the construct, if it's for deformity, if it's degenerative, and they have... Um, you know, good alignment, meaning CSVA is less than uh, two centimeters. Um, so those are the basic guy, uh, rough outline and uh, I'll use for those cases. Cool, thanks, man. Yeah. Any other questions? What about from our trainees? Nope. That was great, Don. Really appreciate it. Like yeah, the insight and the, the detailed overview. So, hope everyone yeah. has a blessed week. And um, if you want to shoot out that link um, to the foundation that you're working with, let us know. <clears throat> I sure will. I'll send it to everybody. Yeah. I appreciate Perfect. you guys. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thanks. Have a good week. Bye.